I'm a feminist, but I repeatedly try to murder my pet knocker hair. I've got one hair on my left knocker. Oh. Um, and if you're listening internationally, that means breast. I, um, I didn't ask for it, but I think when something's lived with you for that long, you have to just admit that it is a pet. Um, and it's like Kenny from South Park, whatever I do to murder it, <laughs> it does return. And it did, actually. When I got pregnant, it went away for about a year and a half, but unfortunately it has come back again and it looks like wherever it's been, it's been very well looked after. <laughs> And I'm livid, and I think if I was a better feminist, I wouldn't care. But I, I think about it at least once a day. <laughs> because it's not like it gives you much warning, is my point. Like, it's not there, and then it's like, oh, a fucking scart lead. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I recently said to a student who was doing an event where Barack Obama was going to attend, if you introduce me to Obama, I'll pay off all your student debt. <laughs> and he said, don't, don't make that offer. I've got a lot of debt. I said, fine, I won't, but introduce me to him anyway. I'm a feminist, but it took me three weeks to build up the courage to use the new sort of walking upstairs machine in my gym. And then when I did brave it, I got to the top of it and got vertigo and cried. But <laughs> didn't get off it for another 10 minutes out of a mixture of stubborn pride and the fact that from that vantage point, even through my tears, I could see right into someone's flat. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but the other day my phone ran out of battery and I had to sit and wait in a cafe for someone like it was 1925. And I thought, fine then, I will pretend it's 1925. And I picked up a book from this hipster cafe shelf and it was the collected essays of Virginia Woolf. And it was so beautifully written and intricate in its powerful ideas, I thought, I'm never, ever reading my phone again. I feel like I'm a better feminist just for reading this. So I stole it. <laughs> I, left, I mean, no one else was really reading it. I left a big tip. They weren't, though. They weren't. No one else. It was, it, was, it was a decoration. It was a hipster cafe. Everyone was on their phones. No one had ever opened these books. They were dusty. It was a decorative Virginia Woolf. And I thought, this is wrong. And I thought, it's a feminist act to release Virginia Woolf <laughs> back into the wild. I'm a feminist, but I'm 34. And on some level, a lot of what I do is probably still to try and impress my dad. <laughs> Yeah, it's not, it's not untrue, is it? I'm a feminist, but I carried Virginia Woolf's collected essays around for a week and never read one <laughs> because I was so busy on my phone. So I returned them to the cafe for other people to read next time I was in. I just slipped it under a pile of papers, knowing it would be read by nobody. And I, I said a little thank you to Virginia for her efforts, but told her she was no longer relevant. <laughs> she is, of course. We just, we're addicted. We're so you tried to please. Live from Leicester Square Theatre in London, this spontaneity shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Jessica Foscue, and very special guests Laura Bates and Shao Ram, talking about innovation. The Guilty Feminists, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Let us begin. Hello. How are you, Jessica Fostigue? Have you had a guilty week or a feminist week? <laughs> guilty. Guilty. Oh, fine. Yep. She's a witch. <laughs> no, any hesitation. I've, I've had a guilty week. Have you? Yeah. What have you been doing? Well, I've just had other people do my makeup for me, so I'm... that doesn't happen to me that much. And so when it does, my... you know when you've just done your nails and you just sort of walk around with your hands oh, like yeah, that yeah. for like yeah. a or day or fake tan and you mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's my face now oh you feel you you feel you can't move your face can't because sip of my the... drink can't talk can't emote no it wasn't botox it was makeup <laughs> and in reality i'd already done my own it's just a little bit of lip they just topped up my lipstick and made my hair look less homeless <laughs> yeah. today we are talking about innovation 
We're talking about in being innovative feminists. <laughs> yep. How innovative do you feel on a scale of one to ten usually? I mean, you're a comedian. You're a creative. Yeah, but so that, that's odd because actually I think I, I am quite change averse. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah, I was looking into why I might be scared of innovation. <laughs> you, <laughs> well, actually, I think that... So what, what I found out is that we're designed to be a little bit into routines and stuff like that. It's sort oh, of how yes, our, our brains, brains are designed. Are yeah. But we I will... Basal put... ganglia to blame for it in our brains. Really? I'm... <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to... Um, I'm just going to push back a little bit and say feminism is in itself a movement of innovation. Well, in that case, I'm an amazing innovator. <laughs> <laughs> you don't catch me listening to my basal ganglia. <laughs> Let alone regularly thinking that sounds delicious. <laughs> the patriarchy is a movement designed to uh, fight for the status quo. And feminism is designed to innovate and change. So the reason we talk about innovation is the very fabric of feminism is change. Mm -hmm. So if we don't like change, Jess, we don't like feminism. I love change. What I meant to say earlier was... Um, I think I might be in love with change. In love with change. Yeah. Alexa fucks me off. To be honest with you, it's like having a sort of very old butler with dementia. <laughs> she tries to be helpful, but never understands what I'm saying. I, um, my uh, mum and stepdad have got one. I hadn't paid it much attention. And then we would stay for a week or so and we came back and I found my two-year-old had climbed up a chair onto a table and was standing up against our 1990s sort of scud-ridden CD and cassette player going, Alexa! <laughs> oh, McDonald! <laughs> that is brilliant. I got it. I've had to get an old McDonald's CD. Yeah. Like children now look at magazines and they just swipe on them and they can't, so they're not moving. So children will now just shout at toasters. Um, <laughs> Stand up comedy. <laughs> then please welcome to the stage the wonderful Jessica Foster Q. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about innovation and me. I think I um, <laughs> I think a lot of the time that I'm innovative, I uh, maybe this isn't the most feminist thing to say. A lot of the time I'm innovative, I've done it by accident. <laughs> I think if I sit down and go, <sighs> have an innovation. <laughs> Try and get a novel thought out. Uh, it's just not how I work. But I do do innovative things, but they're not, you know, they're inspired rather than grafted out of me. Um, uh, for example, personal safety. One of the best examples I've got on this is that once someone tried to mug me, but luckily I didn't notice. <laughs> uh, it's a new approach. It's dark, I was on my own. It's very tired, as usual. I was thinking about 800 things at once, sort of like a fat alley, thin road. And um, <laughs> there's no one else around, and this man starts walking towards me. Clue number one that it wasn't a friendly encounter. He walked right up. So his face was right in my face. And rather than feeling scared, I just thought, oh, it's one of those awkward pavement <laughs> encounters. <laughs> I was just like, ooh, <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> which way are you going? Uh, <laughs> anyway, he went, where's my money? <laughs> and I stood there and I thought, oh, poor sausage. <laughs> He's lost his money. <laughs> and, and he must have thought I was the most arrogant person he's ever, <laughs> he's ever met because the next thing I said, genuinely st stood there for a bit like that. And went, have you definitely checked all your pockets? <laughs> <laughs> genuinely livid now. He's like shaking with rage, a lot more aggressively. He goes, seriously, where's my money? I still... Honestly, didn't feel scared. <laughs> I stood there for a horribly long time thinking, I don't know. 
Santander. Uh, and, and in reality, I went, I'm sorry, I'd love to help you, but you're going to have to give me a bit more context. Um, and he walked off. <laughs> That's innovative. The mugger walked away, feeling rejected. <laughs> Get in. Also, in terms of innovation, I'm not sure we've got our priorities spot on when it comes to uh, the innovations and inventions that we give great press to. For decades, we've all been saying, oh, it's the best thing since sliced bread. What? <laughs> What's so special about sliced bread? It went on sale in 1928. What was happening before then? <laughs> How much time was slicing the bread taking people? <laughs> Was it like loaf topiary with like precision based, artful, all consuming? I suppose it was pre Netflix. <laughs> Were people starving in armchairs because they thought they didn't have the strength to cut the bread? <laughs> what about carpenters? Because they'd just been sawing through actual wood, hadn't they? Were they getting to lunchtime and going, no, no, actually, I can't take any more? I don't think that they were that low on energy, especially considering they'd just mustered the vim to complete an entire world war. Or maybe there was some kind of knife drought. <laughs> I mean, people talk about sliced bread a lot, guys. This is my point. Was there a knife drought? Were people weeping, desperately trying to cut bread up with spoons? All through 1927, were families having to chew bread directly from the loaf? And if so, what's wrong with that? I love chewing directly from the loaf. <laughs> Why were they so happy to have it already sliced? What were they going to do with the enormous amount of time it saved them? Three more blinks. <laughs> it's time we improved the phrase, and from now on, friends, let's ditch that one, let's ditch that, and when something's been brilliant, let's be more accurate and say, yes, it's amazing, it's the best thing since the reusable slash recyclable menstrual cup. <laughs> <laughs> or if that's not catchy enough for you, you can just say, ah, oh, it's the best thing since the pill. <laughs> Thank you very much. Xiao Lan is an entrepreneur who has created a new visual way to learn Chinese, which she hopes bridges the gap between East and West. She has an app and a book, and her project all started with a TED Talk. Laura Bates is an innovator who founded the Everyday Sexism Movement, which crowdsourced examples of minor sexism or sexual harassment from women's daily lives. She is now publishing a new book called Misogynation. Please welcome to the stage, Xiao Lan and Laura! <laughs> So, Shalan, can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do? Because you are an innovator in ed tech. So, you are creating apps, ways of learning that we can all have on our phones that make things easier. And the thing that you're doing at the moment is learn, you're going to teach me to speak Chinese. Yes, I'm going to teach everybody Chinese. And it's important because there are too many of them. <laughs> we need to learn how to communicate with them by knowing what they are thinking about in their head. I, when you say them, in a very... Are you I'm not one Chinese? of them. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. You talk about uh, innovation. In China, people embrace innovation. And the progress, for example, the artificial intelligence research, everybody is embracing it. Here we are talking about, is robot going to eat the job? And yeah. our, uh, is there a public, <laughs> like the government is going to put on the uh, surveillance on our spying on our privacy. But Chinese people, they just love it. And uh, <laughs> what, do, now, just to be clear, do they love robots eating their jobs? Yeah, I, I, I just want to spy on them. Just put it out there that when it does become available in a restaurant okay. to try, I will eat a job. Let, let me make it very clear. I'll eat a whole it's job all on air, so I need to make it very clear. They love it because they would like a robot to take over the jobs they don't like to do. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we all want robots to do They can do something yeah. Yeah. else. And then in terms of surveillance, they don't mind because uh, they make a life uh, safer, the society more convenient. And for example, if you can get the fast track visa to go to Singapore, yeah, a little bit inconvenience is fine. Yeah, well, there are times when I would imagine Chinese people would like extra security and it makes life safer or faster. I imagine there are some Chinese people for whom that's not true. 
at times? Um, yeah, I really don't want to stereotype because uh, it's a big country with a very sure, long Sure, exactly. History. So we can't speak about Chinese people as if they're a monolithic group all of whom love all security. I just think we need to, <laughs> like, because um, I feel like maybe that might be... Uh, so, so, but in general, well, what you're I think saying the generalisation is... we can make is that almost everybody on this panel would like to at least try eating a job. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And in general, you feel there's a stronger trend for Chinese people to embrace technology than there is in Britain? Um, yes, for example, uh, the mobile payment. Chinese people is 50 times more than us. Wow. Five wow. zero. Every Using single their phones thing to buy things. To like, for example, split the bill right. in the restaurant and then to like send money to their parents, things like that. They do it 50 times more wow. than what wow. we are doing. Not surprised about is the sending money head, to parents. Is that <laughs> per head though? Is that, because there's a lot more people in China. Is that per head? That's each individual uh, yes. is using it 50 yes, times more. Yes, each person. And the reason is that the credit card did not take off in China. So they jumped straight ahead with mobile payment. So this is a leap forward. And Laura, you did something very innovative. And in a way, it was a precursor to the Me Too movement, wasn't it? You basically said, could everyone just please document when these tiny microaggressions, or sometimes larger macroaggressions, how they're happening in a sort of unremarkable way in our day? Yeah, yeah, please listen to us, believe that this is happening through that collective voice, which was a precursor to the kind of recent manifestation of the Me Too movement, but of course not a precursor. It's important to say of the original Me Too movement, which was set up by Tarana Burke first. So I guess it's nothing new. In a way, it's a kind of rehashing of consciousness raising circles that 70s feminists kind of did. So it's amazing, actually, for something so simple, you know, can we listen to women, please, that it was considered so innovative. And yet... A lot of men found it extremely in terrifyingly innovative. I was in the street recently and a guy offered to help me find where I was going because I was looking at my phone. And he said, oh, I, I know the, the offices, I'll take you. I'm going in that direction. And as we walked there, he said, what are you going to talk about? And I said, equality and diversity. And he went, oh, God, we've got to have some fun. And he crossed the street to get away from me. Wow. <laughs> so we've got ran, to have ran some from fun. from equality. Yeah. You know. Ran from the word equality yeah. back to the safety so, of... Of yeah. abuse of power dynamics. We've got to have We've some got to fun. Have some fun. So there is that interesting, weird thing. In some ways, it's not innovative at all. It's, it's very simple. It's storytelling. It's the oldest thing there is. Mm. But in other ways, to hear women's voices apparently is still something that we consider very shocking and new. I feel like I should have met Laura before. And the other day, I was having my photograph taken by a newspaper. And the chap said, oh, I photographed someone like you the other day. Um, uh, she was a lovely young girl. She does something called everyday sexism. <laughs> and I said, that's Laura. I said, I don't think she wants to be described as a lovely young girl, though. And he went, ooh. <laughs> Feminists, oh, I suppose I'm being very sexist. And I was like, a bit, a bit, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was just so funny to hear you introduce. I can't remember her name, but she was a lovely young lady. Yeah. Do you know who that was? Yes, the guy had taken my photograph a couple of years ago, obviously, and had said, oh, we'll do a massive picture of you because you're blonde and pretty. So um, what we'll do is we'll just cut out a lot of what you've said. Um, we'll, we'll take out the words and they'll just want a big picture. And I think he thought that was a real compliment. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I'm a bit pissed off he didn't say that to me. <laughs> They've used quite a lot of my words and the picture's quite relatively small. <laughs> and I'm now like, the fuck was wrong with my face? <laughs> oh, blah, 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 feminism. Blah, 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 equality. Blah, blah, blah. Tiny face. Picture. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Um, Shalan, what's the relationship with feminism and China? Is there anything in the history of feminism that comes into the language where you feel these things come into make an interplay? Yes, the Chinese characters actually reveal a lot of secrets about Chinese culture. So for example, the character for woman is the shape of a woman kneeing on the floor with a breast sticking out and hands crossing like that. So it's like a page three picture? Uh, it, no, it actually shows her submissiveness to her men. And then, by the way, this character in the ancient time only meant the unmarried woman. And then nowadays, that means female in general, any female. And the character for married woman was the combination between this female character mm. with broomsticks. 
Oh. So now she's on the floor, but she's got a broom. <laughs> she's got a broom. She can clean it. She can clean it because she's married. Yes. Wow. So it's pronounced as fu. And the character of a woman pronounced as nu. So now the Chinese word for female in general, they say fu nu together. So a married one with the broom and the unmarried one. So that right. is the building block of another 477 characters. For example, the character for the two women together, that means argument. <laughs> wow. And three characters together means adultery. So if three women are together, they're having an orgy. And that's, <laughs> that's the implication. There's that no does men sound like feminist. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, can we report this character to everyday sexism? Because this is... <laughs> This is yeah. Laura. Would you we'll know that this? feminism's finished when instead of a broom picture on there, there's just a pie <laughs> with some nunchucks. And what? then the 477 characters, they are either about female or something else, either horrible or wonderful. For example, the character for jealousy is a woman with household. So woman in the household, you create jealousy. So there are a lot of horrible characters, starting with the woman as a component, but there are also a lot of wonderful characters. Everybody knows Ni Hao. Can you say Ni Hao? Ni Hao. That's it. Ni Hao means hello. Ni is you. Hao is good. You good. And good is Hao. Hao is the combination between woman and a boy. <laughs> so when a woman had a boy, she was good. And <laughs> so, I so, so, wonderful... so the word for good, the root of that is woman with son. Wow. And there are some wonderful characters. For Where example. are the wonderful ones coming in? Wonderful. Like, like, <laughs> okay. been quite a long on the ones. Laura's been writing everything is, down this is for wonderful. everyday sexism. Okay. She's noting every single bit of this and no. she's reporting China. <laughs> This for its I'm origins. Good. I mean, the okay. thing is, our origins are appalling as well, and we Absolutely. didn't get the vote till. No. What I'm telling you is what happened so, thousands no. of years ago. We are not responsible yeah. for that. No, We're not accountable. No, no. Just thousands of I'm years ago. I'm not blaming ago. you, Shala. <laughs> just to it. You're just you're breaking this down for us. But it is interesting because we can see the roots of the patriarchy everywhere, and it's even in these sort of pictures which are forming forming culture. And all of our ancient cultures yes. had these ideas in and them. And the character for wonderful, it's a woman and a young person. So when the woman was young, she was wonderful. And that was what they were thinking about, okay? But nowadays, I can tell you, every single woman in China is a feminist. Every single woman in China is a feminist? I think so. That, I'm delighted to hear that statistic. Deborah, we okay. need to take the show there. <laughs> we really need to take Laura, the show there. are you feeling like questioning that statistic? That every single woman in China is a feminist? Well, I, there's some amazing feminist activists in China, definitely. So, you know, I, we're I, having I, more success there than we are here in, you know, getting everybody on board. Although more and more people are. Are you doing any sexism board, in China? Yes, I think there's one in the works in China. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. That's really, Look, really exciting. Women are very powerful in China now, mm. nowadays. And a very practical reason is because there are 33 million more men than women. Because there's because shortage of, the... of women. Uh, women, they have a lot of power. And as a result, actually, a lot of parents, they have uh, abandoned the sexist culture I just described. And then now they actually uh, educate their girls, uh, which was not the case thousands of years ago. There was a guy called Confucius. Um, we've, we've heard of him. Uh, yes. <laughs> he, said, yeah. he said stuff. Yeah, he, uh. said, he said a lot of great stuff, which I admire. But he also said something. He said, only women and the villain, villain the bad people, mm -hmm. the thugs are very difficult. So he said that, and then I couldn't sleep. I feel sleep. like if Confucius came in here now, I'd show him difficult. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, we are difficult. Get used to it, Confucius. Exactly. Um, Modern China, they have come a long way. So what I told you was thousands of years ago. And if modern Chinese people could abandon the old, obsolete thoughts and then move on in the modern society with the innovation, if you don't mind, um, I think there's something we can learn from them. Yeah, interesting. 
How are you innovating, Laura, at the moment with everyday sexism? What projects mm. have you got on? Well, I think what we like to do is really, really simple but effective. So we take the hundreds of thousands of testimonies of people who've shared their experiences with us, which range everything from sexual harassment, street harassment, to workplace discrimination, to sexual violence. And we very simply try to take large categories of those and put them in front of the people who can change things. So we take the stories that come from women in the workplace and we put them in front of politicians who are looking at tackling the gender pay gap. Or we take the stories that have come from young people who've experienced sexual violence and use them to work with schools and universities to start conversations about sexual consent. Or we take stories just from, from women on buses and tubes, for example, and trains and work with the British Transport Police to retrain their officers to tackle the problem better. Because so often these things go completely underreported. So they don't know what's going on. Um, we know everything that's going on but don't have the power to change things. So we try and put those two things together. God, that's interesting. So you're working with the Transport Police yes. to try and get the numbers of everyday sexism tweets down basically <laughs> essentially so to, are you to get the numbers work yourself of, of it, reports they know about being obsolete. Oh, well absolutely that's the end goal it of is, feminism isn't yeah. it to make itself obsolete but that project project guardian's been going for a while and has raised the reports of sexual offenses on the transport network by around 30 percent what? So it does have a wow, big Wow, that's name, incredible. Though. Why did you start this? I had a really awful week where by sheer coincidence within the space of about six days, I was followed home by a guy very aggressively sexually propositioning me and not taking no for an answer. I was sexually assaulted on a bus on my way home quite late at night mm-hmm. and said out loud what was happening because I was on the phone to my mum at the time and everybody on the bus heard me and they all looked out the window. Mm. And it sent me such a powerful message. This is, don't bring this into the public domain. This is your thing. It made me feel incredibly embarrassed, ashamed, guilty. All the emotions that belonged with the guy Mm. sexually assaulting women on the bus. And I got off the bus at the next stop and ran the rest of the way home, never told anybody. And it wasn't until ages later that I suddenly looked back on that night and I realised what a powerful message he got as well. Mm. Carry on. And other men on the bus. Nobody will step in. Exactly. Um, And then a few days later, I was walking down the street and uh, walking past two guys who were unloading some scaffolding off the back of a lorry. And I was literally within a metre of them. One of them turned to the other and said, look at the tits on that. And I sat down at the end of this week and I was just thinking about how I felt pretty rubbish about it all. And it just, it suddenly hit me. If they hadn't all happened in the same week, I never would have thought twice about any one of those things because it was normal. I was used Mm. to it. Mm. And I thought, why am I so used to it? Why is it normal? Started talking to other women and girls, thought that perhaps a few would have a story to tell me. And instead of, you know, this one thing happened to me once, it was every woman I spoke to. And it was on my way to meet you just now, this happened. Um, So I wanted to try and, you know, talk about it because when I started using that word, sexism I came up against a brick wall sexism doesn't exist anymore women are equal now Mm -hmm. and I thought perhaps if we could share those stories widely enough people might see the problem it might not fix it but but they would see it and then people started coming up later on after 100,000 testimonies came in and it kind of took off in the way that it did with their own really innovative ways of tackling it and that's been really exciting so we hear from individual women about things that they do um, which is really helpful to share, I think, because you yeah. end up getting, you know, that moment where you're really tongue-tied and you think 10 minutes later or 10 days later of what you wish you'd said. Yeah. So mm. these women have really great examples, which I love to kind of share and, you know, have just in your back pocket. Like there was one woman, for example, who said that men used to shout at her in the street, just pointing out that she had big breasts, just shouting, big tits, big boobs. So she started doing this thing where she would look down and scream like she'd never seen them before. <laughs> Um, well, there, was, um, there was a girl who was about 11, I think, and she was the only girl in her science class at school. And the boys used to say, you're rubbish at science, that's why you're the only girl in the class. And one day she just went in and sat them down and looked at them really seriously and said, actually, 12 people isn't enough to be a statistically significant sample. So some scientists yeah. you are. Which, you know, that worked for her. There was a woman in the workplace who said that um, her colleague would always say, don't mind her, she's on her period every time she disagreed with him. I know. So she said, if I had to bleed to find you annoying, I'd be anemic. That's a good one. A really good one. But my personal absolute favourite is a woman who was walking down the street and a guy was working up on a roof doing some work up there and he started shouting at her really nasty, sexually explicit stuff. And because he was on the roof, she felt like she could sort of push back a bit in a way she might not have felt safe to do otherwise. So she shouted back and said, you know, how would you feel if I was shouting about your genitals as you walk down the street? You know, don't talk to women that way. It makes me feel, why, why are you doing that? And he did not take it well. So he started shouting worse abuse at her. And she looked at him and said, you know, I, gave, I tried to engage in a dialogue. I gave you a chance. And she just took his ladder down and left him up there on the roof. <laughs> Do 
you know what? If you've given them a shot well. at reasonable dialogue and empathy building, and they will not hear that, leaving them on the roof to starve <laughs> yes, the in next a very thing, real yeah. way is the next obvious step in society. That's fantastic. And so these are all innovative ways to deal with everyday sexism. Mm. And of course, you know, it's not a structural solution. And we're no, seeing no, no. But still, we, a lot of we men the... now wanting to say, what do women do to fix this problem? You know, what should she have done differently? And obviously the answer is there is yeah, no... Not get there is nothing. Not get exactly, we've got to stop get, yeah. it. But it's satisfying and I know that it has a good knock-on effect because I told this story at a literary festival recently and an organiser emailed me afterwards and said, you know that story you told? Well, there were a group of women who were in your event and they were walking to their next event down the street and there was a guy working up on a bridge. <laughs> no. Yes, he shouted at them, so they took his ladder away. <laughs> oh, wow. So they used... That was innovation. That's because right. that's, that's, that's when it is innovation and not a one-off. When we... Please, well, welcome to the stage, Deborah Francis White! <laughs> Jess said before that when she tries hard to think up good things... Her brain freezes. Does anyone else have that? That is because trying your hardest is not your best strategy. Uh, you don't have your best ideas when someone called Derek wheels out a whiteboard into a poorly lit room and says, come on, no ideas are bad ideas. As if all ideas are bad ideas. That's the tone of his voice. And you think, God, I've got to think of something good. I've got to think of something intelligent. What's a good thing to say? So I'm going to show you now how we collectively together are brilliant at coming up with things. Now, one of the things I do is come up with screenplays, like, uh, like movies. And if I said to you now, Simon in the front row, <laughs> come up with an idea for a thriller, <coughs> how would you feel? It's a stressful situation, and I understand that, Simon, and that's why I'm putting you into it. Simon is coughing and is asking to be excused. It's, ha it's hard to do that. It's hard to do that. But collectively, it's easy if we just start with, uh, Sir, what's your name? Tony. So this thriller is about a man called Tony. Not this Tony, another Tony. Okay, and Tony starts with the letter T. So we're going to use the alphabet. Tony has a job that starts with the letter U. What is that job? He's an undertaker. Well, that's good for a thriller. Tony is an undertaker, but he has an obsession that starts with the letter V. What is that obsession? <laughs> Not... Okay, um, some of our feminist audience have shouted out vaginas like they're in a comedy club. <laughs> violins! So each night he comes home and he crafts violins, he plays violins. That's his real love. He, now, he is obsessed with somebody. or well, not obsessed with, that's too harsh, Tony. He's very interested in somebody that he's never met. And that person's name starts with the letter W. I heard Wilhelmina. He's obsessed with Wilhelmina. He thinks about her all the time and he's never spoken to her. Wilhelmina has a job and that job starts with the letter X. X-ray. X-ray. I've heard X-ray. I heard she does X-rays for a living. And he walks past her every single day on his way to the Undertaker's because, of course, those things are very closely connected. Um, <laughs> In fact, they're sort of in the same hospital. And he wants to stop and say something, but he can't. And then one day, something happens that starts with the letter Y. What? Something, something starts with... A yachting accident happens, that's right. There's a big yachting accident. And half the people have been brought in needing x-rays and the other half have been brought in dead. And that means they need to work together. They need to collaborate. They need to collaborate. Suddenly he has to talk to Wilhelmina. Wilhelmina says, I'm not sure if this one's for me or for you. And yeah, it's touch, touch and go. And the first word that comes out of his mouth, that he's never been able to say anything before, and he's nervous and he stutters, the only thing that comes out of his mouth is it starts with a Z. What is it? I heard zoinks. He says zoinks, and he goes, that's not cool, zoinks, what? No, no. And he feels really, really embarrassed, and she looks at him, and she asks him a question that starts with the letter A, and I'll take that from the bench. Have you been listening? I just realised that is something. They've just, been, they've just been having an adultery of, of, of the time. Are you peckish? Are you peckish, she says, because it's lunchtime. And he is, so he suggests they go somewhere that starts with the letter B. Burrito. 
Burritos. He says, burritos. Let's go for burritos. So they go out. They wash their hands well. And uh, <laughs> they go out for burritos. And they discover they've got something in common. And that starts with the letter C. What is coffee. it? Chinese food. Ca I heard coffee and cat. <laughs> what was that? Chinese food? I'm afraid I have to take that from Shaolan. I don't want to give her precedence because she's on the stage, but I am compelled. Uh, they both have this thing in common that they both love Chinese food. And they laugh and they go, why are we having burritos? Because that's, that's Mexican. That's what, they just go, what are we like? What are we like? I thought you wanted burritos. I thought you wanted burritos. It turns out we both love Chinese food. And so, um, so they leave that place together and they go to a Chinese restaurant that neither have ever been before. In fact, it's never been in the town before. It just suddenly sort of, they go down a dark alley and turn left and turn right and they find themselves in front of a Chinese restaurant that's very dark and mysterious but compelled to go in and it starts to look at a D. Dungeon. Dungeon. Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. Can you see when you trust what is obvious to you, the group has a mind. We're all innovative when we relax. So they go into a restaurant called Dungeons and Dragons, which appears to be a Chinese restaurant. And when they get into the basement of the restaurant, where the waiter, who is called something, Igor, that, <laughs> Igor with an E, though. Igor with an E. Unusual spelling, Chinese. And uh, they, they get down into the dungeon of the restaurant where Igor with an E has taken them. And they are seated uh, in something that, you know, you expect to be at a table or in a booth or something like that, but it's something that starts with an F. Where are they? On a futon. They're seated on a futon, which is unusual because it's Japanese, but they've... <laughs> It's a fusion mix, Johnson and, and that Dragons. one from Ikea. And it comes from Ikea. Yeah, fusion mix. It's a fusion mix sort of restaurant. It's Asian, just gen generic Asian, they're realising. <laughs> and so they're taken into this place and they're put onto this futon. And then a man comes out and he's carrying an extraordinary Stradivarius violin. He just passes it over and he says something to Tony that starts with the letter G. What does he say? It's a good one. Go for it, he says. Go for it. And Tony is like, it's suddenly, something comes out of his mouth that starts with an H, but it's a Chinese word that starts with the H sound. What's the Chinese word that starts with the H sound? Hen hao. Hen hao. He says he didn't know he could speak Chinese. It just comes out. It's like really mystical. He's just like, oh my God. And it freaks him out because he knows what it means. Hen hao means... Very good. Very good. <laughs> Very good. And it's the character for a woman doing laundry. And... <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Um, and he starts playing the sweetest music on the violin he has ever played. Because he loves violins, but he's a little bit, you know, amateur. But this, there's something about the Stradivarius and the moment and the Dungeons and Dragons basement. And Igor standing there, suddenly it comes out and she looks into his eyes and she's suddenly compelled. She realises she's in love with this man in an instant, like some kind of fairy tale. And it's at this point that something happens that starts with the letter I. Okay. Uh, again, we're not at the comedy store asking for an improv suggestion. I, something happens to us with the letter I? Improvisation. Improvisation. Ironing. 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 Not ice assert, no. <laughs> Sorry? I've got iPhone illness. Suddenly he looks down and he realises that his iPhone has an illness. And it's like it's disappearing on the table. And she looks at him, she looks him in the eyes and she says, I'm afraid we're going back in time. <laughs> and she says, there's a reason that you're compelled by me and you've been in love with me for many years. You're not from this time. You, many, many years ago, were a famous Chinese violin player. <laughs> and it was only when you buried Jerry. <laughs> and Jerry in Chinese means, is there a word that sounds like Jerry in Chinese? Is there a word that's, that could be heard, sort of something in the, she's it's overheard in Chinese. Who could you have buried? Is there a family member? I've heard Jared from behind the curtains it's like now. Unc, aunt. Mm. Aunt. Yeah. What's the word for aunt? E. 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 Yeah, Jerry. So, oh, you're your aunt e. Jer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's only when you buried your aunt Jer that she was sort of sucked, you fell into the grave and you were sucked through a portal out and that's why you had to become an undertaker. Because some graves are portals, they're like time hatches and you were sucked into the 21st century but it is time for you to go home. And I am that portal and that's why I am the one who x-rays because I can see right into your heart. I can see the moment that your heart was born and your heart was born man and she sends him back 
into China in the 1700s. And there he comes out of the grave on the other side. And he looks down at the grave that he's standing next to. And he realizes that it says, here lies Wilhelmina. And he looks at it and he says, Wilhelmina, Wilhelmina, I love you. And from the grave, he just hears the one word that starts with letter K. What is it? (laughs) This is the naughtiest audience. A beautiful word that starts with letter K. What is it? Kiss! Thank you, sir. (sighs) Audience full of female feminists that takes a man (laughs) to be romantic. (laughs) So women are all passing knockers and kiss them in. (laughs) And and Wilhelmina says kiss from the grave. And she says, you may have one last kiss. And she appears as an apparition. And he kisses her on the lips. And he's suddenly overwhelmed with a feeling of Love. 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 And... What that starts with M? Meaning, magic, and mourning. (laughs) And that is the story of Tony and Wilhelmina. Thank you very much. Shalan, you're in tech. How difficult is it for a woman to be an innovator in tech? How much will the structure of tech support you? Because I've heard stories from women in tech that are very much the everyday sexism stories. When I was much younger, back to Asia, that was a bit harder because I was a student and I looked like a student. So a couple of times when I went on the conferences and I sat on this stage, something like this, and people would say, oh, excuse me, secretaries are in the back. Wow. Secretaries are in the back? Yes. And I said, sorry, I'm that person. So that happened when I was much younger. And now I could see there's a lot of improvement. And I meet up with entrepreneurs around the world in Silicon Valley, in China, in Japan. I can see most places, there are a lot of accomplished females. And I can see it's a great improvement, but still we can do better. How would you like to see women better supported in tech? I would say the best thing is to give them the equal opportunity. And don't judge them based on their look. Don't judge them based on their gender. Just look at what they do. Do you think if there was blind judging of new innovation, like, for example, there was a a short film festival in Australia and anybody could submit a film and they had the successful entries that were shown at this festival. It was something like 90% male directors and filmmakers and 10% female and they didn't know what to do about it. So the following year, they had a gender blind judging. So there were no names attached to anything and there was no way of knowing whether a man or a woman had directed or written it. And then it was 50-50. Mm. And because unconscious bias. And it doesn't really help. That was help. an amazing reaction, guys. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't really help to have women on the judging panel because we've all been seduced into thinking mm. that white straight men are better at everything. Mm. It's true. If you have £100,000 to put into a hedge fund, put it straight into the suffragette and Kickstarter. But... <laughs> You know what I mean. Say you had a lot of money and it was all you had and you had to invest it all in the same place. Are you more likely to give that to a white man in a pinstripe suit or a black woman? We've just been brainwashed for years and years and years and years through the representation that we see. And we have to consciously redress our bias because no point saying, oh, well, I wouldn't notice that or I wouldn't see that. Or we're all having to retrain ourselves all the time. If you get on a plane and the pilot is a woman, you hear a shudder go around the plane. Do you cover stuff like this in everyday sexism? Yeah, absolutely. There was a great story recently, actually, about a female pilot who was taxiing down the runway. And it must have been a fairly small plane because she heard a man on the plane say, it's all very well, she might be able to take off, but how's she going to park it? And she stopped the plane and kicked that guy off. Oh! Yeah. Oh, my God. That's incredible. She actually got up. Came out of the cockpit. Yeah. The Incredible Hulk. The Incredible Hulk. I I admire that. There are these amazing stories of women who do these kinds of things, and you just kind of think, you're my hero. The other one of those that I heard recently that I just absolutely love is a woman. I'm not sure what country she was in, but she was traveling on the metro, and a guy was taking photos up her skirt with his phone. (gasps) And when she caught him, she made him eat his SIM card. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. You know, wow, so that's yeah. She made him eat. She made him How eat. How did it. she get him to do that though? I think what happened was that she 
realized what he was doing and started shouting about it and shamed him and he panicked to the extent that eventually she was shouting you don't do this you can't treat yeah. me like this getting more and more people involved he was getting more and more terrified and eventually in kind of desperation to yeah. end said, the encounter it. he he ate it, it. Yeah. <laughs> I love this story. Technology's not going to eat us. Oh! It's the other way around. <laughs> That's an example of a job eating a robot. Um, uh, yes. Oh, God. Well, could you teach us a little bit of Chinese now? Um, so is yeah, there, what's I'm the sure. word for feminism in Chinese? 女性主义. And what's the word for guilty? Um, that was a 罪恶. Okay, so how can you teach us to say those things? Because they sound hard. <laughs> I, I can't say either of those. And uh, do you okay. put guilty first or do you put feminist first in Chinese? Uh, and, first. And is this, what sort of Chinese is this? A uh, Mandarin. Mandarin, uh, Mandarin Chinese. And there are only 800 million people speaking that language. So, uh, so we... how hard can it be? <laughs> that's exactly right. Uh, that's... <laughs> okay, I... oh, right. imagine you are the ancient caveman living in Chinese region. And that was thousands of years ago. Can I imagine I'm a cave woman though? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Cave woman, so cave good. person. Cave feminist. Yeah, yes, go on. Cave person. I'm imagining I'm a cave feminist. Yes, and Got then um, you saw your child, you drew a kid, and you saw your dog, you drew a dog. You saw the, the sky, the cloud, you drew a cloud. Sure, sure. got it. So that's what you do. And then you saw uh, someone with something bulbous around their chest, like a shelf and a broom. You draw a wife. <laughs> That's exactly right. And then, so you draw the things, and then when you run out of things to draw, you start thinking, oh, I'm thinking deep. I'm like a philosopher. Um, and I want to have a rest. So to describe rest, you have a person against a tree. Right. So that's the character for rest. Okay. And then when you have a horse breaking into the door, that means to break in. Okay. Mm. And then when you have a woman a underneath horse the... wake breaking into a house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's a horse burglar. And that's how <laughs> This is in. not as easy as I thought. Why is the horse up against a tree? I don't <laughs> there was the no horse stuff. got a broom. Right. I don't there was no Starbucks in ancient time. And then horse breaking into the door nowadays, that means to break the red light. Oh, oh. run someone, a red light. Yeah, or you horse go, going straight through a barn door. Yep, or the bugglers come into your house. That's the same character. The horse breaking into the house. That's again. right. And that then, horse. <laughs> okay, so. You're a great student, by the way. Yeah, well, I've certainly made jokes about all of them. Whether I'm going to be able to remember all of them, <laughs> those are different I'll things. I'll give you a private lesson. The character I'm in for, for that. Peace, people are very yeah, mm. the, the character for peace, there's a woman underneath the roof. So now we are talking about something emotional, something deeper, abstract. So a woman underneath the roof, that's a piece. That's so from Guy's perspective, though, because she could do the domestic service oh and the God. reproduction. For a second, I thought, I love it when I get home. I really get that. You know, it's just me, home alone. <laughs> Tom's out. He's not in the picture. Jim Jam's I'm on. Full Bravo. chill. Absolutely. Absolutely. Chuck a bit of Mad Men on. Uh, <laughs> The spare and very secret ice cream stash at the back of the freezer. No one's home, just me and the cat. Can the cats be in the drawing? Uh, little tub of Hagen dazs Let's not go crazy. That's You're a feel- very complicated character. She's <laughs> doing. Yeah. But it turns out that the reason that means peace is because the guy's out and he's like, I know that what's at home is all chill and I'll come sure. home to a roaring fire and a pair I of slippers. I need to make sure that... Little you- did he know, two other women had come round, so it had been... <laughs> Chicka bow wow! <laughs> I'm going to make a disclaimer. Can you please make sure you added this part in? What I said was all the ancient Chinese things. Ancient, yes, yes, absolutely. And nowadays, I think because women, they are, we are very calm. And because we provide the world peace. I would like to think the characters in the modern interpretation and the reason of telling you the ancient stories is to say, hey, this is how human beings evolved in such a big nation. Mm. But nowadays, it's very different. Sure. How do we learn the pronunciation, though? Because I'll be honest, the way when you said feminist, I don't think I'm going to get to learn guilty. Just tell me mm-hmm. feminist. 女性主义. 女性主义. That's it. 女. So 女. Nu. Can everybody nu. say it together? 女. Nu. 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 And it's a third tone, so we make an effort. Go down first and up. 女. Nu. 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 Make nu. an effort, guys. 女. Yeah. <laughs> xing. Xing. What xing mean? Xing means gender. Okay, Xing. And it's actually a very good character. It's a combination between the heart and birth. 
So the birth of your heart, <laughs> then you create the gender. <laughs> That's so nice for transgender people. It's the birth of your heart. It's not just yeah. about your genitals. <gasps> I'm going to tell everybody that. That's, that's so amazing. I'm, so, I'm so, that makes me very Is he, happy. I'm imagining he a heart Shing. out of your tongue. Shing. <laughs> so, Shing means gender. Shing. Shing is gender. And nu xing together means female. Nu xing. Nu xing. Nu xing. Nu xing. Okay. So that's female. And then zhu. Zhu. Zhu means master. Master. Yes. Zhu. And here means the doctrine and the principle. Zhu. Zhu. It's a third tone again, as you can see. I Zhu. make an effort to go down and up. And that means master. <laughs> yes. So we've got woman, gender, master. The last character, E. 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 I can do that one. You're both yeah. cheating. Y I E, fourth tone, so go down. And that means principle. E. So the master principle. And so here means is... the doctrine, the nism, something like that. So female, gender, birth of your heart. Master principle is feminism. Mm -hmm. I really like that. So new, new xing chu yi. 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 Some other translation, they may change the second character into quan. Quan means your power. Your power, chen. Yes, it's interchangeable. It's up to you. I now need to know, because I feel it's not going to be as good a story, break down guilty for me. Is it just like a woman looking ashamed because she's looked in the mirror. Uh, um, actually, it's a good is one. It, is it three women and then, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then just one just, just sort of quite nearby One just it. leaving hurriedly <laughs> as the man comes through the door and she's getting out the window. Right, what, the and then they're just arguing when he arrives. And the, the two. other two pretend they're having an argument <laughs> <laughs> while they get their clothes back on. We were Sorry. Okay, in new just what, I'm inventing new characters. I mean, uh, we're so innovative, guys. Uh, you, know, you know what? Um, you said exactly right. Chinese is very easy. We invent things. And then if you like it, you spread it, you coin the new words. And that's how it got that's how spread it happens. on. Yeah, and that's how they pass on generation after generation without paper, without iPhone. And can you quickly break down guilty for us? Sure. Two characters. The first one, Zui. 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 I've made an effort. Zui. That's a combination Zui. between net and the wrong. So when you net the wrong, net, net. like catch something netting. in a net. Yeah, netting. Yeah, in the net ancient the time, wrong. Uh, they had a net, like a butterfly net. Okay. So when you net up all the wrong things, then that's the guilt. And the second character, that means evil. That's a combination between second and the heart. So when your heart has a second thought, that may be the angel and the devil, you are wandering between the two, then Sui. that's evil. So together, zui e. Zui e. Zui e. Zui e. Zui e. And now with the iPhone, you can learn how to speak because you can hear the sound. And then if you speak back, the little robot inside your phone <laughs> will judge. How well you speak. But will it eat your job? <laughs> it's that eat, will eat it's my eating job. your job. That's fine it by me. It's absolutely eating then your I job. Then I do something more fun. And the thing is... <laughs> more fun than this? <laughs> more fun than that, this? That's just coming on the talk show. Come on. Nothing's more fun than this, Shalan. We've got so, to have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so guilty feminist. I'm going to have a go at guilty feminist. Okay, yeah. ready? Zui yeah. on. <laughs> So wait, uh, new thing, chew it. You got it. You Yay! nailed it. Yay! So uh, new thing, chew it. Do you have, Laura? Do you have an "I'm a feminist" part for us? I do. Go on. I'm a feminist, but when an American right-wing male commentator wrote an open letter to my husband, warning him that he would one day come home to find that I had burned down our house, stolen all his money, and run off to join a coven of lesbian witches. <laughs> I realised I hadn't even begun to scratch the surface of how much fun feminism can be. <laughs> um, Shalan, do you have an I'm a feminist part? Yes. I'm a feminist. But when I go on a date with a dude, <laughs> I will let him pay the bill because I don't want him to think I'm the rich Chinese who is going to buy him a house in Mayfair. <laughs> It's 
too, it's too good. I think I'm a little bit in love with you, Shalan. Yeah, I would likewise. happily, I'd happily buy you dinner. Thank you. It's, we're right here in Chinatown. <laughs> Shall we go and have an adultery plus one? <laughs> what's, what's for women? You can coin it. The space is free for you. Oh. Oh. Real estate. <laughs> Chinese character real estate, guys. We're going to call it so good. Okay, so one woman, one woman just sitting on the floor with her breasts. Uh, two shell, women, like two women is an argument. Like Three women shell. is adultery. Four women, feminism. A coven. Mm. A feminism. A coven. A coven. A coven. Yeah. A feminist, a feminist coven. coven. Feminist coven. Feminist coven. Do we have any questions from the audience? What's right. your favourite Chinese character? I'm glad you've asked. Um, <laughs> I really like the woman with the broom. No, so I think that question was for Shalon. Um, I, I love the character for peace. And the reason is that I don't really believe a word of the ancient people said. I would love to give a new interpretation. And a woman underneath the roof, that means we have peace of mind because we are very calm. And because we are the centre, the foundation of the world peace. <laughs> Laura, do you have anything you'd like us to do for everyday sexism? Yeah, just sharing stories, spreading the word, letting people know about it, and maybe having a conversation if you're a man in the room with women in your lives and um, listening to them, listening to what they have to say, because it might surprise you. Wonderful. And if you are going to, because you've heard this recording, if you're going to write into Everyday Sexism, um, if you could hashtag Guilty Feminist so we know how many people we can direct, because that could be useful for maybe a future joint project. Yeah. Great, okay. I have a slogan for you, actually, Laura. Oh, yeah? Amazing. Um, bridge the gap between female and male. The slogan for Chinese is not really a slogan. It's a mission we are trying to do. Bridge the gap between the East and the West. And there's a big gap. We think there's a great wall of Chinese language and the culture. Those people are mysterious, but actually they are not. If we pay mm. attention, imagine there are 300 million Chinese people learning English at the same time. Are we going to pay some attention to them? The same thing is we are in the feminist show and I don't see many men here. There are some. So we've got Simon and Tony <laughs> and the, the guy that said kiss. There's loads of them. Well, I reckon our listeners are sort of 20% male. We love having men, but we're also an unapologetically female space because there's not that much for us. We are mm. thirsty. It's nice to have our own spaces too, but I like ones that are inclusive to men and I love the men who come. I really do. And do lots of men report everyday sexism too? They do. We have a kind of three-way split between men reporting their own experiences. Oh, I thought you were um, going to say men, exp- men going, I just shouted at a woman on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> Big tits, that wasn't right. cool. I've done it now. I thought I'd report myself before You're anyone not does. Far off. Uh, yeah. gonna, do, have yeah. you ever had anyone be like, I've just seen someone with massive tits? What am I meant to say? <laughs> I can't just say nothing. No. No. <laughs> but we do we do get a split between men reporting their own experiences, men reporting things that they've, you know, witnessed, things yeah. that have affected women they know and love and that have kind of galvanized oh. them into action. And men sending rape threats and death threats and emails that say things like, there's no such thing as sexism, you stupid bitch. <laughs> nice. Which really answers itself. Nice. Okay, Jess, do you have anything to plug? I started my own podcast called Hoovering. It's about eating. <laughs> <laughs> um, please listen, it's very fledgling. I did the first episode and I thought it was fantastic. And that's, was, back. And that's I thought, before wow. I'd learned to edit or do stings. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, no, it's really good. If you like food and you love Joseph Hostoku, you will love this show. And Lord, I'm on tour with my show, The Silence of the Nans. Please come. Do come, do. It's just delightful to spend an hour with Jess. Laura, what, yes. what should we buy of yours slash download <laughs> slash look at? Uh, my new book, Misogynation. Misogynation. Now, what you've done is a, like a Chinese thing of bringing characters together, misogyny and nation. Yes. I'm just pointing that out. Uh, and that's a picture of a man without a ladder. <laughs> and hundreds of women standing around going, ha ha ha. Um, so by misogynation, we can still buy the book Everyday Sexism. Yes. And where can we get Chinesey? You can download it from uh, your iPhones. It's called Chinesey Cards. And it's a simple game you can play and flick and uh, do the quiz. And also I tell stories. And there's a book here as well? Yeah, there are a couple of books. And this is the first one out a couple of years ago it's called Chinesey. And I'm working on a new book about ancient Chinese philosophy. Wonderful. Oh, we look forward to reading that. Oh, I forgot to mention, I also have a podcast. It's a daily show on iTunes called Talk Chinesey. 
only talk Chinese. Talk Chinese. Okay. It's only ten minutes a day. So every day I will teach you one word. For example, guilty. Oh yes. Something for like example, sui <laughs> uh. Yes, you got it. It's gutting okay. that I've learned that, but not feminism. <laughs> Very that fisty. does speak volumes. <laughs> to keep track of everything we're up to, you can follow Guilt Fem Pod on Twitter or The Guilty Feminist on Instagram. There's also a Facebook page you can like and a mailing list you can sign up to. And if you like what you hear, please go to what we're now calling Apple Podcasts and rate, review and subscribe. It helps other people to discover us. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Just before we go, I am currently trying to help Yusuf and Amina and their children, Ibrahim and Bilal. They're Iraqi refugees currently living in Austria. They've been through an absolutely hellish time. ISIS took their house, um, but they managed to get to Austria. They get a little flat and some food rations and 10 euros a week. And they're very grateful for it. Uh, recently, Amina became paralyzed and went to hospital. And she's now being sent to a hospital six and a half hours away because her condition is so bad. And she's been told she'll be gone for six months. Now, her boys are eight and ten, and they miss her so much. And Bilal just said, the little one said, if mama can't come home from the hospital, I'm going to go and live there. Two things that we need to help with this. They get ten euros a week, so they can't afford to visit their mother, and they've just been through so much trauma. They need her. They're doing brilliantly at school. They speak German. They speak Afghan now because there are Afghan kids at the school. They're just incredible kids. They're so bright. They're winning prizes. They're brilliant football players. They need to be near their mom. There's no move to move them. And their asylum application has been rejected. We really do need help from anybody who knows humanitarian people, activists, and especially immigration lawyers in Austria who would get on their case. But in the meantime, I'm trying to raise 10,000 euros because it's 270 euros for the three of them to get on the train and back and have an overnight stay in the cheapest hotel room. And they have to take three trains to get there. But they want to see her every weekend if they can. So 10,000 euros is that plus a little buffer for, you know, some food and if they have to have an extra night stay or something. So we've got tins up the back. I mean, you've paid to come to the show. There's no obligation. But if you've got anything, they would really appreciate it. They're so moved. Every time I talk to Yusuf on Skype, he cries. Like, he's just, like, so moved that people are wanting to help him. And I said, look, I don't know if we can get you asylum. I don't know, but we'll try. And he said, trying is enough. And I found that very, very moving because it's just like, well, someone out there cares. So even if you've got a pound, it just makes him feel like, oh, somebody's put a pound in, somebody cares. And obviously Amina, but she's in hospital, so Yusuf's the one I mostly talk to. Also, we have a GoFundMe. If you go to the Guilty Feminist page, guiltyfeminist.com, and you see Yusuf and Amina's story, you can click through. And if you could give some money there, that would be amazing. If you're listening at home, if you've got anything in your pocket today, you wouldn't mind sharing with them. It's a really sad story, and they're lovely, lovely people. Also, if anybody else lives in a country and is hearing this and would take Yusuf and Amina and their little boys literally uh, uh, it's I'm working at, uh, quite a bit with various refugees at the moment and one young lad Musap he puts it amazingly he just says this is not my planet it's because the only place he can live is he's from Darfur the only place he's allowed to live he'll die I really think this is not my planet is a really it's just like a strong line it's illegal for these people to live on planet earth right now in, in except in places where they'll die so if you could do anything to help there'll be more coming up we've got a whole podcast about the volunteers in Calais coming out soon as an extra Guilty Feminist show. If you can do anything to help, we need to innovate because there are 22 million people currently displaced in Europe and 43 million in the world. So this is something we need innovation for. We desperately need to collectively come up with ideas and help. Um, so if you could do that, I'd really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Have been listening to the Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Bratz's wife, guest co host Jessica Foster Hugh, and our very special guest, Laura Bates and Shao Lan. Recording at Shamus Mr. Shop, music was by Mark Hodge, the producer was Tom Salute, speaking to the Spontaneity Shop. Mr. Christina Moore, and everyone at the Leicester Square Theatre, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. So, this is a podcast, and uh, that means... Oh, hello, there's a man taking a photo from the side. I don't think so, sir. Um, <laughs> there'll be none of that. There'll be none of that. It's... If you want something more natural, I'm happy to go with... <laughs> but I don't want any side on... I mean, you're very welcome to take photos, don't get me wrong. Um, you are very welcome. But you are never welcome to take photos side on of me or any woman ever. <laughs> Um, that's just a rule for life. It's a rule for life. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to get on with the show, so please turn your phone.